So good morning, everyone. Everyone got a shirt? A great role on the shirt? Yes? Welcome to the education hackathon. There's still people grabbing a shirt, but we got exactly one hour to present this, and then we have to get rid of the stage. So we are doing this very quickly, and therefore I want to welcome you. Uh, I'm Nick van Breda. I'm the organizer together with Puck Simons, and my partner, Dennis, is somewhere in the back. Dennis? Dennis? Dennis is uh, also filming, but he's also a volunteer for the security, so he's doing a lot of roles today. Um, this is for um, changing education. We are all striving for a more personalized way of education, and therefore we partner up with some uh, great initiatives and from startups to institutes that are doing everything to make education the best as possible for children, but also for uh, higher education and university, and even beyond that. The, the main goal is to create an environment where you, where you can lifelong learn, place and time independent. So the cases also will be broader than just school context. And education can be applied in every sector, and that's why it's so important, and that's why I'm happy that you're all here together with us to join the Education Hackathon. Um, I want to present Tel Kundrink. He's going to give an opening keynote about the future of education. Uh, he's a great guy that started his own school, and he has a lot of didactic research he, he has done. So he knows a lot about education, and a lot about the system of education that it is today and is tomorrow. Um, Puck is going to present the other guys. Well, we got three cases today uh, where you can choose from and uh, go wild on. Um, uh, uh, one is Kennisnet, and uh, uh, we got a lot of mentors uh, for Kennisnet. If Kennisnet people want to, uh, yeah, raise their hands. So if you're going to choose the Kennisnet uh, uh, case, talk to them. Uh, next, we have Avance Innovative Studio. We got a lot of mentors for uh, for that one too. Uh, if those people can uh, raise up their hands, okay, great. Uh, and for, uh, last, we got Presente. Uh, we got a lot of mentors for those two. Uh, Presente. Presente. Yeah, yeah. Put your hands up. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to give the word to Tel. Um, a lot of luck and uh, a lot of pleasure. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. cool. Um, thanks so much for this stage. Um, the challenge is when talking about the future is that our brain has a lot of trouble comprehending it. Our brain tends to think about the future in incremental ways. We think about how the current situation looks and what it would be when it's just a little bit better. But that's not actually how the future works, and especially at this time. The future will be different because try to imagine explaining a concept like Tinder, like what Tinder will do for your love life, to a caveman. <laughs> You're trying to explain to him, you know, this Tinder thing will really help you get women. His response will be, is it like, you know, getting a lot of meat into the village? No, not quite. Is it like getting a big club or something? No, not quite. It's such a different concept to him that it's impossible for him to comprehend what it would mean and what it would be. So when I'm here, I'm supposed to, you know, tell a story. What will the education of the future look like? But it's hard to comprehend because the story would start with, you know, little Johnny goes to school in, you know, 2050. But probably Johnny won't go to school. The, the assumption that there will be something like a school then, it's probably not true. There won't be this building that you go to. There won't be this classroom setting that you go to. It will probably be a much more interactive form. But it's hard to comprehend from where we are now. Um, learning subjects from a source. I mean, when we think about personalized learning, we still think about cutting up a book and putting it into a computer. But we still think of a new version of a book, as opposed to a completely different approach to learning. Um, reaching a degree, degrees will probably be useless in, we in about 20 years, because it's such an outdated way of looking at gathering knowledge. And having teachers, there is a person who will teach you geography. That concept probably will be outdated too. So we have to look at something completely different. And what I'm going to do is give you an overview of different things that are happening and that are going to happen in the future. And I'm going to give some examples. And from there on, I want to help you get practical. First, I'm going to explain to you why you should listen to me. 
you know, why should this guy tell you what, what the future is going to be like? Then I'm going to try to prove that change is coming, and not just a little bit, but a lot of it. What will the major areas of change be? What will education look like in the far future? And what will be the next step? And from there on, I want to look at how technology can have a humanizing effect. Because usually we look at technology as an isolating effect that we get more individual, but it, it should bring us together as people. And then I'm going to look at what does it mean for me, but especially what does it mean for you? What can you do with that, especially in the light of this hackathon? So why should you listen to me? Um, I'm a warning of how the school system can go wrong. Um, I spent two years longer than you should on high school. I, spent, I went to three schools, almost got kicked out. It went wrong in almost every way, even though on paper I've been proven to be extremely talented. But it really didn't show in the school system. And I became an entrepreneur. Um, I set up three different companies. We've helped over 400 different schools change their approach to education, especially towards gifted to children. So I've seen a lot of schools from the inside, and I've seen how you can get schools to change. I have an IT background, actually I had a, an IT company, I did complex data analysis, so I know a little bit about the technical side too. And I'm the founder of several schools. Uh, we started the School of Understanding, which started late uh, last August, and now we've got 150 kids, so it will be 230 kids after the summer. A second school is coming with already a waiting list, it's not even open, and we already have a waiting list for kids who want to sign up. So change is possible. We started it, and we're going to make it happen. And I really made this my mission. My life is about changing education, not just here, but around the world. So the first thing is, is change coming? Because there's a lot of talk about change, but is it really the case? Well, one of the most prominent people who is trying to prove that is Ray Kurzweil. He is the leader of innovation at Google, and he did a lot of inventions, and he's been talking about the singularity point. And what he did is he looked at what some of you might know, Moore's Law, the fact that about every 18 months the amount of computing power for the same amount of money doubles. But doubling means an exponential change. It doesn't mean a linear change, but it goes up faster and faster and faster. But if we try to plot that over, for instance, artificial intelligence, then it starts out that we take a long time to get to the point of having an insect brain being simulated by a computer. But by the time you get there, Within 20 or 30 years, you get to human brains. And then within just a couple of years, you get to all human brains. So the exponential curve makes that change goes faster and faster and faster. And he also shown this based on the different developments that we've had in humanity, from life starting to us walking to more recent things like you know, electricity and personal computers. And you see the amount of time between those changes is shorter and shorter. And what he proposes is that there will be a point that there will be almost unlimited change in a single moment. Because by the time that a computer becomes as smart as the 10 smartest people in the world, those 10 computers in one computer will start developing the new computer that's even smarter than themselves. So that will become an exponential change, which is almost impossible to predict what that will mean. So change will come and it will go faster and faster and faster. What are some of the areas that in the coming time will change the most? Because Ray Kurzweil founded the Singularity University, which is a university of revolving around this transformational change, and there's a couple of areas they're following and they're very actively involved in. The first is big data and data science. We're spending more and more money and time to gather as much data as possible, analyze and come up with new answers. Uh, Netflix spent over 100 million euros or dollars actually to predict what movie you will like because if they get better at that you will stick around longer and you'll spend more money with them and we're getting better and better at that data analysis we're getting more and more and better sensors uh, one of the things is the X prize you might have heard of it which is a global challenge to tackle big problems and one of the X prizes is the company that's the first one to produce a real tricorder. And maybe you know it from Star Trek. A tricorder is what the doctor uses. He just goes bleep, 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 and the thing tells you what's going on. The, the assignment is to build one. And I think you get like 10 or 15 million if you're able to do that. And Xanadu pretty much did that. A device which any mom or any person can use to diagnose the most common illnesses with a lot of sensors on board, artificial intelligence, to be able to predict those things. Imagine that we've got just a device that fits in your hand that can do pretty much what a doctor 50 years ago wouldn't even be able to do because he didn't have the tools yet. 
virtual and augmented reality. You have things like Oculus Rift, you've got the HoloLens, and all these different things where it's reached the point that you see articles, there's been a lot of attention to this lately, but that in ex exhibition booths, and it might be around here as well, that the point's been reached that people put this thing on, they get an experience, and at some point in the experience, you see people throwing the goggles off and running away scared. It was so immersive that they actually got such a deep, frightening experience that they threw it off, and they couldn't relate to it as being, oh, I'm just in an experience, but it was so real to them that they got this real visceral reaction. So this is reaching a new point. Artificial intelligence. Uh, the people who created Siri are, are creating Viv, which is a new platform that you can actually interactively interact with and just ask questions and give complicated assignments. You know, find the best you know, flight for me to go from here to there with these parameters. And the thing analyzes it, collects all data, and gives you the answer. Bioinformatics and neuroscience. And um, a friend of mine started a company, I've invested in it, Omnigen, which is doing personalized DNA analysis. I took a little swab from the inside of my cheek, and now I've got a report about 25 pages saying which sports I should do, whether I'm better at you know, athlete, long-term sports, or power sports, what my recovery rate will be, what injuries I most likely will have or not have if I um, interact with sports a lot. So we get personalized DNA analysis for, you know, a hundred, two hundred dollars, which is again something that two, 20 years ago you wasn't e weren't even able to do. And local production, 3D printing. You know, 3D printers are coming, becoming more and more prevalent. One of the um, patent requests that Amazon has done is that you can order something, and they've got a truck, and in the back of the truck is a 3D printer, and when it's driving you to deliver it, it's actually building what you ordered. So you're ordering something that's custom made with your name, with your colors, and it's building it while driving towards you. So these things are becoming more and more possible. So what does that mean for education? So these are some big changes, but what is that gonna mean for education? This big data and data science, um, a friend of mine set up Leer Unique, which uses big data, uh, in this case, the assignments that kids have done in school, so a lot of interactions, there's a lot of material in that. And he created a lot of dashboards based on that, so you can actually see growth curves. But not just that, he created a predictive model that you can use to predict dyslexia years before it becomes apparent. Because of the types of error a kid makes when he's six, we can predict that at seven or eight, he might be proven to have dyslexia. And we might actually prevent it, because we can see the pattern. There are algorithms we can use, and we can predict whether or not that's going to be the case and how to support it. And that's just like a teeny tiny tip of the iceberg, because there's so much data we can analyze, we can be so much more personalized and support kids better. Virtual and augmented reality. You see that, for instance, doctors now can learn about anatomy using virtual reality and actually deconstruct a brain or a human and actually look at it from 3D and turn it around. Same about uh, that they have people learning how to work on fighter jets. They can actually take it apart, looking through virtual reality without having to buy one of these. So you can have an entire classroom of 16-year-olds take apart of a hundred million dollar device without needing to have it there. So that adds to the reality of the experience. And we're also getting more and better sensors. One of the companies I'm working with is called Reveal. And they created this little band, and it's pretty you know, simple and it measures stress level. And why is that important? They've made this for autistic kids. Because the problem with a lot of kids who have autism is that on the outside you don't see a lot. Not a lot's happening. But suddenly at some point they escalate and they have a calamity and they get angry and they start throwing stuff or screaming stuff. They really get into a very much stress stressful fight or flight response. What they did is create a bracelet so you can measure the stress response and the teacher has a little app on the phone and the app will say, you know, little Johnny is already almost two-thirds of the way of the stress level that last week was the level that he got really upset. So we can predict that, and we don't have to have that happen anymore. You can get a little timeout, or we can support him, or we can give, give him all kinds of support. And this seems like a little thing, but this makes it possible for some kids who now get sent out of the school system because they're not manageable anymore, because everybody's afraid when they get angry or they run away or they start screaming, it's not possible anymore. We can manage that in a regular education system. So we're opening up to thousands of kids who can't follow regular education by tracking them and by giving the teacher more information, we can support the kid better. 
artificial intelligence. Uh, there was an um, <coughs> example in the US where a teaching assistant that was helping online, they replaced him with an artificial intelligence bot. And after a couple of months, in the beginning, some people suspected something. After a couple of months, they could answer things like 80 or 90% of the questions that the student had, and the students didn't know it was a computer. So we can have all these interactions, like personal interactions that would be really expensive or impossible to do. The computer can take care of that. And you know, local production 3D printing. One of the things that a lot of kids, and probably with you as an audience, you can relate to that, liked about learning to program is that you can build something real. In the school system, a lot of kids feel like I'm in a sandbox. I can pretend to do things, I can play around, but it's not real. But once I found a computer, I learned to program, even with HTML or whatever language I learned, I could build something real. I was six years old, I was nine years old, and I could decide I'm gonna build something. And the cool thing is with 3D printers, we can take it one step further, not just virtual stuff we can build, we can actually build physical stuff. And this is a mini toy. $299, a 3D printer, that you can use in your classroom with all kinds of apps, like low threshold. So this means that we can do a lot of different stuff, a lot of things that used to not be able to do. And in bioinformatics and neuroscience, what if we can use that DNA information to customize education to you? As opposed to saying everybody needs to have the same level in math, for instance, we can maybe determine what is your ability to learn, what are your learning styles, and how can we adapt to that faster than by trial and error? But to adjust it to you, just like with a sports team, we can work with your talents and find out what they are. Then we can make a difference in that. I think the more fundamental change is what do you learn? Because technology is nice, but it's always a means to an end. And if you look at the future, you can divide the future up in kind of three different ways of looking at it. You have the known future. The known future is that we know that kids who go into school now and they're gonna be a lawyer, we can teach you what you need to know to become a lawyer. You know, there's just a list of stuff you need to know, we can check it off and then you're ready. But some people we need to prepare for the unknown. We need to put them in a place, for instance, when you're gonna be a project manager on an IT project. We don't know what project you're gonna do, so we can't teach you how to do IT in healthcare and how to do IT in education, but we can learn, teach you processes and skills that whether you're in healthcare or whether you're in education, the skills will help you navigate that unknown field. But there's also a field of the unknowable because the fields you're gonna be in are, are unknown, but you can know them. But what life is gonna be like on Mars when we get there is unknowable. There's nothing we can do now to predict what you need to have. So what should education do? To prepare you for the known, you need knowledge. We need to tell you what to do. To prepare you for the unknown, we need to teach you skills. Because with skills, you can navigate the unknown. But with the unknowable, we need to train your attitude. Because the only way to, to deal with the unknown and the uncertainty that goes with it is perseverance, optimism. You know, looking at a way that's not helpless, but having an internal locus of control the way you deal with that. And this is what you see in startups. The difference between a startup that wins and makes it and one that doesn't make it isn't the amount of skill, isn't the amount of knowledge, isn't the amount of degrees, but the attitude of the people running it. If they're optimists, if they're persevering, if they've got grit and they're like, I'm gonna go for it and I don't care what happens along the way, they'll find the skills, they'll find the knowledge. And if they think, you know, I've got an MBA and I know all the things that I should know to start a company, they'll crash because reality doesn't look like the way you get, get taught in a textbook. And I love this quote by Eric Hoffer, in times of change, the learners will inherit the earth, while the learned will find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And this is what we're seeing more and more. The world that we've been prepared for doesn't exist anymore. So we need to be prepared to learn how to deal with the new world. The most exciting changes, knowledge is becoming a commodity. If you want, you can, for, uh, you can go through an entire MIT university course. Th so it used to be that you needed money to get knowledge. All the knowledge is available if you go online. We do have to look at what are we as humans good at as opposed to machines. Because machines can do a lot of cool stuff. They can replace it in a lot of areas, but they're not empathic. They're not creative. So this is what we need to focus on. This is what gonna get, what's gonna save your job. If you're empathic, if you're creative, you're doing the things that machines cannot do. 
we're going to be more and more connected with real life. That's one of the things that we're looking at here too. Like school shouldn't be the sandbox that we're going to separate you from the world for 18 years and then we're going to throw you into the world, but you should be connected with the world the entire way. And it's going to be the big equalizer. Because even when you're in, you know, Uganda, you can still go online and still all knowledge is available. So you don't have, you know, the backlog of being born in Uganda. The knowledge is there and internet will come there soon. Progress based. We will guide kids more based on progress than on are you a good eight-year-old. And it will be more inclusive as opposed to, you know, you're autistic, you should go to a special school. More and more kids get the chance to do all these kinds of education. So what will be the next step? Because I kind of look farther into the future. What will be the next step? And I had the luck of being a juror at a competition in Amsterdam. And in the competition, they asked for all kinds of people to come up with ideas for a new type of school. Anybody could send in ideas. There were about 250 applicants. Uh, there were about 50 who got the chance to present. And there's a couple of themes that came up. And those are what I think will be the next step. The first is personalized education. The thinking that you are eight, year old, eight years old and you should get the materials that every eight year old gets is completely outdated. Because some kids are 10 year olds and they do math at a 15 year old level and they do you know, language or spelling at a seven year old. So that should be personalized, it should not be age bound. The curriculum should be aimed at life, not at some archaic theory that you need to learn, but on the things you need to be able to live. It should be connected with community. It should not be isolated. There should be no boundaries between schools. Why do you have primary school and then you leave primary school and you go to middle school and you leave middle school and you go to high school and in high school you can't ask middle school questions but also you can't ask university questions because that's not where we are. It should be one flowing movement actually from zero to the end of your life. Schools should assume differences between students. It's not that we're trying to cope with the differences and trying to survive them. We're assuming everybody's different because everybody is different and we should make use of technology. We always should be making use of technology every step along the way because it's a shame not to. I do want to warn you that you shouldn't take two small steps. And two examples is I had a presentation by Samsung, which is, by the way, a great company. I've got one of their phones, but their presentation was about the classroom of the future. And what they showed me was a bunch of laptops and you know, digi screens and printers, and proudly they were announcing, and it all works together. And I'm like, no shit, I, I hope you got it to work together after you know, 20 years of working with this stuff. But that's not the future. That's just getting the basics right. And the same happens with you know, methods in school. We get a new math method, and it's on the iPad. We're really proud. And what is it? It's just a PDF document on an iPad. It's still the same. But you click on it, and you get a little movie. Woo! <laughs> you know, that's exciting. Those are such small steps, they really don't make a difference. I mean, they make the difference in the backs of students that don't have to lug the books around. But if that's the goal, I, I hope we're aiming a little bit higher. So why is change so hard? When we look back, we only see the successes, but a lot of them actually don't make it. And I know that I talked a lot with the government, uh, the Ministry of Education, and it's the country's greatest capital in two ways. We're spending a huge amount of money on education, and it's the kids. And actually, an inspector of a school inspection once said that you can do your experiment over. You can start a school again. So you're trying to start a school, it doesn't work out, you just do it again. But the kids that were in your school, they can't redo their school time. And that's a big risk. We don't want to sacrifice kids to your experiments. And that's actually a valid point. And there's a matter of ownership. Nobody is the owner of the education system. So nobody can decide to change it because there's so many levels and that has advantages and disadvantages. So how are we going to change that? You can take the revolutionary approach and then you just you know, spend a lot of money on it, you know, throw money at the problem, you buy all kinds of new stuff and then things will be by leap into the future. But there are a couple of caveats, because it's kind of risky. One, it doesn't have high success rates. If you do a startup that's way out there, then the chances of it succeeding are lower than when you make an incremental step. One other thing is that it's important to stick to your specialty and know what it is. Uh, what I see a lot is, um, for instance, in that competition, that people have a specific idea about education. For instance, kids should move more. If kids would meditate, they would learn more. Both are true. But if you only have, as a theory, kids should meditate more, are you then capable of setting up an entire school? 
and doing the finance of the school and, bu and building management and reaching the core curriculum goals. There are so many specialties that go into setting up a school that you shouldn't, like if you look at Elon Musk who set up Tesla, he had an idea of I wanted you use batteries to drive cars and he had to invent the entire product line from scratch. This guy had to do so much, and he, you know, he's best friends with Larry Page, and he threw a billion at it, and he's having trouble. Because some problems are complex. There are so many different areas that need to be managed. Find ways to go from just the early adopters to the majority, because that's where usually the business is. And be pragmatically optimistic. You have to be an optimist, otherwise you don't start these things. But you do have to be pragmatic in how am I going to go about it, and how I'm going to make this work. So that's the evolutionary approach. And I use the Trojan horse approach usually. You sell something that people want to have, and then you give them what they should have been asking for in the first place. And you try to combine the two. That's the safest way of a business model where you can actually make a big change. And do that in connection with the current need. But do have a vision of this is where we're going to go in the future. So what are my next step? I'm going to go for the revolution. I'm going to set up schools all around the world. Because I think by setting them up, I can control them. I can make the di biggest difference. I invest in mentor startups that have a big difference they can make, and I develop tools. And the evolutionary approach is to help schools transform. Like, how can we make help schools make the next step and use a 3D printer or teach programming or teach those mindsets and push against system nonstop and support the incremental change? So what are your next steps? One is to think big and fearless. Never be afraid to have a huge goal and go for it. But do connect it with the current need because you might be 10 steps ahead and you do need to connect with the people who can only see one or two steps ahead. Decide in what area you're going to work. Are you going to work in the known? Then you can look at how can I make things more efficient. The known is learning vocabulary. You can make a fruit ninja program that helps kids learn vocabulary more effectively. So then you're more efficient in the known area. You can go to the unknown area and see how can we support the tools and the skills that kids need. So how can you use you know, Scrum, for instance, in education? Those are wonderful tools that you can build to support that. And how are we going to go towards the unknowable? How can we support people making a huge leap? And how can we work in incremental sprints? Do I love the Scrum methodology of trying something, building something, try it out in practice. Build, try, build, try. Don't go into your ivory tower and think up of a solution, spend a year and a half and, and, and spend 150,000 of somebody else's money. It's good fun, I can tell you, but it usually doesn't warrant a lot of change. So always go back to practice, find schools to work with, run pilots, and get support and work together. And one thing that I really want to you know, em emphasize is be open, ethical, and transparent. And I love what, er what, um <coughs> what Nick's doing with that, with the vow that you're going to do in a little bit. So don't be that guy that's going to have this vendor lock-in system. You know, I've got this system, this is my knowledge, and you can't touch it. Have open APIs, work together with everybody, because we're doing the same thing. We're trying to change the system. But most important, find something you're passionate about, because it's hard. Changing the world is hard work, and that's okay. Because if you're doing something you're passionate about, you're willing to put in the hours, and then you can make a difference. And it's definitely worthwhile. So never let anybody take you away from that goal. Let's all fight for a better education system, because it needs an overall. It's way overdue. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So we're now going to present Kennisnet. And we have opened up the presentation here. We have to switch the computer for a second. So now we're about to start the case presentations. Please stay here. This will be exciting. Give him applause. This is Rick de Visser from Kennisnet. Thanks. Um, Tal has told you something about how the future will look like. I'm going to uh, tell a thing about how the present looks like. How the present looks like 
uh, at schools. And I'm not talking about the traditional schools that we all know of. I'm here to talk about the schools that are actually progressive and they want to uh, include uh, personalized learning in their educational model. I'll give you a few examples. This is actually a school. This is uh, an organization that has uh, a couple of these trucks uh, that travel along with uh, people who work um, at the fairground. For the Dutch people, it's uh, Kermis. Um, because in the summer when uh, these people are traveling around, their kids, of course, have to go to school uh, and they provide the education uh, to these kids. But in the winter, uh, the kids um, go to their regular school and they have all uh, different methods, of course. So the difficulty for this school is how to deal with all these separate backgrounds of these kids. And here becomes clear that personalized learning is not only something that we uh, um, can work f uh, uh, up around for the future, but this is also actually needed right now. So how to become more personalized in this, in this way? Um, it's vital to uh, gather, gather a lot of data that the, uh, the children already produce when working on their methods, working on their exercises, and also uh, uh, doing things at the, the schools that they work on in the winter. And if we can gather this data and learn about um, how they are progressing uh, in their personal development, then these teachers at the, the traveling school can be much more precise in advising these kids in uh, where to work on. Uh, another example is a school uh, in uh, Almere. Um, they actually, they don't have regular classes anymore. They work with workshops, with experts who are really not knowledgeable on different subjects, uh, coaches. And the idea is that, of course, you don't learn only in the school itself. You can, you also learn at home. Uh, uh, you learn in, in different situations and not everybody learns in the same way. Um, so for this school, they have a lot of different um, uh, developments going on. Actually, every child has his own development and can go to uh, the workshops that are actually uh, applicable for uh, this specific person. But then you have all these different developments and for a teacher to be able to address uh, uh, the children on the right moment and in the right way to know uh, uh, how the teacher can help him in his personal development. Uh, again, it should be clear what the development is of these children. So again, data can, the data of the children can play an essential role. So what we did with, um, with Kennisnet, we opened a platform together with uh, PEORAAT, and um, that is a project that is financed by the Ministry of uh, Education. Um, and here, schools can um, initiate projects uh, if they want to improve their educational model towards personalized learning. And what we see here on this platform is that a lot of these questions that schools have are all around gaining more insight in the personal development of their children. So what we did, we brought the, the schools here. Uh, you can raise your hand uh, uh, if you are from the, from the schools. So these are actually the, the target group here. Uh, if you are going to work in this case, you have direct impact on how these schools can improve the educational model. Um, so it's all around uh, um, learning and gaining insight about the data of children. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for your presentation. We're now going for the next one, which is going to be Avance. And uh, I have a 360 degrees camera over here, so I want you to smile and raise your hand. Smile. <laughs> Wait a second, it takes a, se it takes a second, so. <laughs> Another time, three seconds it takes. 
three, two, one. Almost, almost. Almost, I think. Yeah, okay, there he goes. Three, two, one. Yeah, no. Yeah, please. I think it works. Okay, um, we will start. Uh, I want to welcome you, everybody here for the Education Hackathon. It was uh, very nice to be here and very nice to make a challenge here. At Advance, we are building um, and going, actually starting next September with uh, a school project. We're schooling uh, that's much like what Tel told us the first half hour. So we have, um, we don't know what you're gonna do. Um, we just have challenges. We don't know which students we have. We have students from 15 different studies, uh, univers uh, universities and vocational schools in the system. So we're gonna have a flexible program. Um, and what we really want to do is we want, we need some tools to get this working because we uh, need a lot of administration in that and we don't like administration. So that's why we need you. So I told you about all the students who are joining us, students from 15 different uh, university uh, studies, students from vocational studies, are joining us at Advance, uh, at the Advance Innovative Studio to make some projects for real companies, so real projects. We don't know what the outcome of the project is. They're just starting up, something like what you do, but we don't do hackathons from 24 hours. We do two week projects. No timetable, no exams, just be there, work on it and reach to a goal in two weeks. For that, we have some people to can help you. We have coaches and the coaches are working with you. The coaches are there all the time. So they also during the day there, so you get a lot of feedback and we're working together with you. We have some ideas of ourselves too. Uh, I'm one of the coaches and there are some two other coaches here in the group that are joining us today. So uh, we're gonna make it up, uh, but we don't know everything. So like the same uh, picture we saw before, we have experts like the school in Almira has, I just saw, and the experts are coming in and they're trying to help you and they have their real knowledge about the stuff you're gonna do. But communication ties in a knot and that's, that's a problem. How are we gonna communicate together? The experts are not there full time. How you keep in touch with each other and how can we do that? So what we like to do, what we need, is some kind of way that you make these people love each other. They want to work together and they try to if to communicate better as in a marriage, in a marriage, because sometimes that goes wrong. Um, therefore, we need some blog, portfolio, whatever it is, where people can work together and have all have the same input. So this should be a group thing. From this blog, the coaches can reach into that, can join it, can comment on it, give feedback on it. So even if the coach is not there at some time, or if you want to work at it at night, and he sees it in the morning, he can react on it and do something with it. Experts can also join the blog and look at it and work with you. But okay, we are a school, we have to do something like, from, hey, you passed this or not. So you have to be able to create a personal blog from it. So the group blog, you have to put out your stuff and make a personal blog for it. So you can take it with you and you go to your other schools, you go further in your career and when you're 35, you're gonna apply for a job and you say, hey, that's my portfolio. Um, the coaches also look in your personal blog and they want to say, well, hey, okay, you passed. Then from the blog, you have to make a resume and the resume is put on the World Wide Web. We can't, we're gonna do it open source. Everybody can may look what we uh, do. Everybody can join, everybody can, can use it. And uh, when you have some 
way of also putting in information we need to start, that would be great. So what we really want, want people from all kinds of backgrounds work together in projects for real companies. And we want to have some kind of um, communication tool to link them all together and to work with together and to publish it on the World Wide Web later on. Thank you. It's time for the last case. Philip Gray, all the way from Austria, I fly over to present this case to you. It's something we have working on for a longer time. Education Act is this is the third edition, and we have to gain those outcomes and use those outcomes more and more over. We have made examination virtual reality. We have used neuroscience to create focused learning, and all these outcomes they just disappear because of the groups. Um, they fall apart and the outcomes are lost. And that's why we need a platform. And Philip is going to present that. Before I talk, can we split this group here, this crowd, in three, three parts? This part, like straight here, and here, OK? And every time I point at one part, this part is capping, OK? Can I can I have it here as well? Okay. Okay, let's go. Together. I always wanted to do it, sorry. It has nothing to do with the presentation. <laughs> so, but before we move on, I want to ask you a serious question. And now go really deep into yourself and ask yourself, why are you here? What is the reason that today, with this beautiful weather outside, we are sitting in a room which is really very wonderful, but why do we want to change education, or why why is it so important for us that we are here? The reason why I'm here and what uh, Nichols already presented, uh, we want to create an online platform and a collaborative structure for the transformation in education. And my offer to you is very unique today. Everybody who wants to be part of it, who wants to contribute, will become owner of this structure, of this organization, of this uh, uh, network, of this community. So what I'm offering today for our challenge is ownership and that you really create your own uh, existence, your own, your own reality in education. Because what we heard before is education belongs to everybody. Um, I'm actually I'm I'm the owner I'm the co-founder of Presentia yeah, Think and Do Think in Education and Social Innovation and for the last four years we have been uh, trying out concepts in self-organization in transformation of systems in ways of how to organize in ways of how we can participate together and how we can really collaborate together all together um, and actually I'm the reason why you're here. So your answer before was why I'm here. We had the first education hackathon two years ago uh, in Vienna. And after that, we had 40 hackathons all around the world. In 20 in we organized 20 uh, hackathons in 20 different countries. Most of the time, I even don't know the organizers. I met Nick yesterday for the first time. So there is a big movement going on all around the world. Many people want to, uh, to change education. Many people think, what is the future in education? The, re the, th the thing is, the, fu the future of education is already here. We just have to, organize to learn how can we organize it better, that this is visible, the future. That we can really break out of our own limits, what we think that, that are holding us back. Nowadays, we have the resources. We have the technology to be all around the world, to have all the education that we need. We, we can really like uh, access with technology 
the best universities from all around the world. You, you don't have to be here. You can be on the beach. You can be on the on the, on the environment where you want really want to be. You can. You don't have to work in in a, in a company anymore for um, nine to five. You can really decide depending on your needs, on your necessis necessities. So on, on on a small level, we can really create it in here with all the potentials that we have. How can we create this on a la on a larger level, on a system level? M we 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 have the knowledge. There are amazing schools out there. There are amazing universities out there. There are people who are really the drive to really change education. So what is he stopping? And very much what we find out, or what we are what we are looking at, it's the structure. There's a structure missing where people can share um, information, where they can share their, their their ideas, where they can uh, share their doubts. Um, and so what what we found, or what what we were thinking that the structure can uh, can deliver is on one side a training where you meet people. We came up with the Aid on Tour, that's a six weeks training, pr training program where you are outside of a comfort zone. You travel with 18 different people in a region where you even don't notice the, the language maybe. And you learn people where you really can learn from how it me what it means to set up your own ed uh, education. And we're not talking about learning only, we're talking about really how can we work together in di with these new paradigms. So um, we came up with the education hackathons and we came up with soul spaces or uh, base, uh, spaces where pe people really live together for six months, for three months, where they really get out of their um, uh, zone in order really to work with, a co with the help of the communities, with the help of people uh, to realize their dreams. So these are fixed places in we have, um, there's uh, Alexander here who, who created it in Vienna. I just came back from Brazil. They are doing in really amazing spots which are open for people who really want to take part of a transformation. And we start here in, 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 in the education because we think this is the best way of really liberate and get out of the limitations that we set ourselves in many, many ways, many um, ways how we see society all together. So what we need for this challenge, we need game designers. We want to set up a IT platform with gamified uh, tools. We want uh, game designers to help to create a community which is also based on batch systems where you really can see how you develop yourself in, um, in work, in learning, where you really can support each other in the community. Um, we are looking for web developers who are creating the prod or are further developing the prototypes that we have. So when you are interested in really creating a um, um, collaborative IT platform, which is owned by the people who are really using it, this was really the moment that you really can join. Uh, we are looking for business growers and people who are really uh, investors with, not they are not looking at how is, has how is business done. We really want to see a community where we find people who say, okay, we don't know where we are going, but let's go together and let's do it with all the tools that we have, with all the resources that we have. What we can offer is for sure, we dream. We want a different world. We, no, we want the same world, but in a different manner. We want a society who, where we meet each other in really in, in ways where we don't have to play, play games, where we don't, it doesn't matter what you're doing, where you're coming from, wh uh, what, what is, what is the, your background, but where we are, we are the same. Um, we play. We want to create our own game. Out of that, if we really start working together, collaborating, collaborating together, we can create an impact together. And the last thing is, we don't want really to create an offer, uh, do a work for offer, uh, offer for work. If you see the studies in 20 years, 50% 50 of the jobs that we know nowadays will be gone, substituted by, by computers, technology that we know. So we really have to think about how can we create a new existence together. And this is what we are going to offer to, to experience for the next 24 hours. And um, out of that, um, we, we are going to meet with uh, you guys who are interested in creating this platform in this I on this island over here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last thing is not a case anymore. So this were the three cases where you can work on. And now we have something special where you got the shirts for on. This is ACDL. Hi. The presentation, I'll put it on for you. Yep. 
These are the guys who are teaching you um, for the computer driving license. It's not for you guys, you already know IT enough to have your driving license. So that's for the general public. That's not my uh, slides, I think. Don't worry, Nick will fix it. Are you having fun today? Yeah? yeah? Okay, great. So do you know, do you ever wonder how to stay cool? How to stay cool in difficult situations? Well, I'm learning right now. <laughs> uh, that's what I want to talk about. Some technical stuff here, yeah. Okay, I need a trigger, I think. <laughs> this is a trigger somewhere. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Great stuff, man. <laughs> so here I am. So did you ever wonder how to stay cool in difficult situations? This session might help you in just five minutes. This is the Erasmus Bridge in Rotterdam. And over here you see a Formula One car. And the driver is Max Verstappen. Max drove his first meters in Rotterdam. Uh, and this was only less than two years ago. A lot of volunteers kept the traffic away, so he could do this stunt. And less than two weeks ago, the same guy finished first in Spain, Barcelona, and he stayed cool, all right? So he trained from his fourth years up, and he has a lot of talent, of course, and he has a mission as well, who will become a world champion in Formula One. And we like to have him on stage, but actually he's in Monaco uh, right now, he's driving. He just stepped out of his car and he's fifth in a row, so he's heading towards his mission. So I'm, I'm second best actually. Uh, so. I'm not as talented as Max, and, but I do have a lot of fun. And I'm in connected to my network, NGN, NGI. So those guys are the IT professionals. And let's look at me a long time ago. Here I am making my own dinner. And I'm on a mission here for the Dutch army. Uh, I've just made this dinner. And it's a kind of outdoor campus party, actually. And in those days, every man had to serve in the army for a year. And at the start of my army time, I had to take a vow. And I don't remember exactly all the words of the vow, but I remembered something. I remembered to always protect my country. So the mission and the vow, together they gave me they gave me the power for every difficult situation. And we as IT professionals, and you become someone later, an IT professional, we have a mission all together. And so we, we like to deploy technology serving its users and society. And we like to ensure that technology remains supportive to men and mankind and to enhance our security and peace. And as an IT professional, I would like you to join me in this mission. I'd like to invite you to put your right hand on your heart and listen to the vow. I will plan, build, run, enable and manage technology in a way that is fit for purpose 
and good for mankind. I solemnly vow never to abuse any information that is trusted to me, directly or indirectly. I will innovate, learn constantly and strive for mastery by acquiring and sharing knowledge. I say what I do and I do what I say. And please repeat after me, I'll live IT. I live IT. <laughs> okay, please stand up everybody. It's now time to take a picture all together because you've done the vow. Come forward. Please, Nick, help me out here. You can even register later on.